Welcome to Halloween in July 4. There is no theme this year, only the best of the spookies. Why spooky games in July? Because I feel like it. It's fun. This month we've got a spooky video about a spooktacular game every Saturday for you. So don't forget to subscribe and check out all the special incentives over on the Patreon to get in on. Just like last year, the Patreon's yearly discount is as low as it'll go, and anyone who pledges this month gets on the new patron apron. Anyone who pledges yearly to get that discount also gets their own handmade patch by yours truly. Or if you pledge at the $5 tier or higher, you'll get your own patron apron, handmade by me with your name embroidered onto it, sent right to your door. Yes, I do make all these by myself because I hate fulfillment companies. So to start things off, we're gonna do a game that a lot of you have been asking me about for a while now, Alien Isolation. Alien Isolation is a first person survival horror game made by Creative Assembly. Yes, the Total War guys, we'll get to that later. Coming off the heels of the actual disaster known as Aliens Colonial Marines. The bar was set pretty low for Creative Assembly to deliver a solid game featuring everyone's favorite slippery little guy, the Xenomorph, or the Alien. Which, after writing this script, I kind of use Alien and Xenomorph interchangeably, but we all know what little scrimblow we're talking about. Do kids still say scrimblow? Now, before we get into it, it's worth noting that Alien Isolation had a bit of an interesting development. Large portions of the game were heavily changed or outright cut, like an introduction sequence before Amanda Ripley even makes it to Sevastopol. Another tutorial section before Sevastopol where the Ripley crew discovers a derelict ship, and entire levels and like story paths were carved out of the game. This game was initially going to be called Alien Year Zero, and was going to be revealed at E3 2013, but that got pulled at the last minute thanks to just how bad Aliens Colonial Marines went over. The game might have even had multiplayer at some point, but it got scrapped, quite possibly in a reaction to Colonial Marines. I don't know this for certain though. I'm not really the person to open up the can of worms that is Aliens Colonial Marines, and frankly, even if I was, I don't think I want to. All right, time for a little confession. After the first couple play sessions of this game, I did everything else I could before getting back to it and finishing Alien Isolation. I worked on other videos. I would go do my laundry. I did world building for the novel I'm writing during time that I initially set aside to play this game. Hell, I taught myself how to make ciabatta rolls for the sandwiches I make for my wife when she's in clinical rotations instead of playing Alien Isolation. The ciabatta stuff was actually pretty easy. It's just very time consuming because of all the rises the bread needs. In short, a lot of Alien Isolation feels extremely tedious, overdrawn, and Basically, the game feels like it's at least two times as long as it should have been. I can't imagine an uncut version of this game after having to fight tooth and nail to make it through a 16 hour playthrough of the base game. Maybe, I don't know, if some of the cut content was there, it might have had the opposite effect where what was in those missing levels would have helped better pace the game. But as it is, my time in Alien Isolation falls mostly into three categories. I need to get to the metro station. I need to get an elevator working. I need to hide from the bad thing. There's also a lot of quick time events that are not really quick time events peppered about everywhere, but I think we need to formally get into the gameplay segment if we want to go any further. Okay, let's get one thing out of the way before we get into the final details of the core gameplay loop. Let's open up another can of worms that I believe I am qualified to go through. No, Alien Isolation is not an immersive sim. Yes, it shares superficial elements with some immersive sims. You crawl around at a lot of events, you theoretically have multiple ways to deal with the Xenomorph, and once you have the means that is, but those all boil down to a dichotomy of you either sneak away from it or you scare it off with fire. Yes, there is a hacking mini game and the code 451 is somewhere in the game, but outside of the progression along the critical path and backtracking for pointless collectibles, you aren't really doing a whole lot of like backtracking and rather than attaining upgrades like as you see fit to make your own path and play style with your gear and your hacking skills, it's all done at predetermined times because the game doesn't 
doesn't dare let you go off that critical path unless you're gonna go pick up some tchotchke to get a bit of lore. You cannot make your own path through your abilities that you choose. You are going to go where the game wants you to be at all times. It's worth mentioning that you can take trams to other areas that are not along the critical path, but then again, that is usually in service of finding a collectible using an item that you didn't have before. Completely restricting a player's freedom is very unimmersive sim. And yes, I have seen the clips of people using a noisemaker to send the xenomorph in the general direction of other baddies in a room, causing the xenomorph to deal with those baddies for you. But I will let you in on a secret I found out by just hanging around. So long as the xenomorph is actively in an area where there are other enemies, its search pattern will eventually overlap with the patrols of anyone else in the area, causing it to kill them on sight. Something heard the shots. Give it a rest. It had to be done, I guess, but it was your idea, not mine. In the best case scenario, this is a reward for ghosting, but at other times, say when the Xenomorph won't actively spawn until a certain amount of noise is made in a level, this is more trouble than it's worth, because if you were slick enough to tactically use a noisemaker, you most likely weren't in any danger from the normal bad guys in the first place, and now you've just summoned a much tougher enemy that you have to deal with. Trying to call a game an immersive sim because it has like one element of emergent gameplay is trying to call a Chili's a steakhouse because they happen to serve a steak on their menu. Well, I can tell you from experience that attempting to put any definitive like set of guidelines on an immersive sim or so much as even trying to discern whether it's a genre, subgenre, design philosophy, or something in between those or outside of those is a losing battle. I can also tell you that something that is inseparable from immersive sims is player freedom. And there is very little player freedom in Alien Isolation. Alien Isolation is a game of limited resources and lots of things that can hurt you. Amanda Ripley can craft things out of stuff she finds laying around, but some resources are more rare than others and she can only carry so much of each thing. This means that you're gonna end up leaving a lot of materials behind because while they're important for crafting, you're at your cap for that item and you haven't found any of the other thing that you would need that allows you to make an item. You're gonna be doing a lot of looting only to find that you're maxed out on everything in a lootable space and you'll also experience a pet peeve of mine. You can kind of look away from something while you're looting to see if a bad guy's coming, but you can't move away quickly because you need to press a button to stop looting and you take a second to move away. This has put me in a bad spot more times than I'd like to count, and it makes me appreciate the leaps and bounds in inventory management that we have made in the following years. On that note, there's a lot of contrived little button presses that you have to do in certain situations, some of which are fitting and add tension to a scene, but most of them are just annoying. I get that part of the idea is that if I'm starting something and I hear something coming, I can back out, but then it takes a whole two seconds for me to back out of anything I was doing. So I may as well finish up whatever thing I was doing, be it opening a door or welding something open uh, because whatever is coming this way is gonna see me and I need to escape more than I need to hide. Generally, a lot of it feels like it could have been a single button press, but no, first I must press E to start the interaction. Then I hold on to both mouse buttons and only then can I start holding one of the directional keys to open a door. We'll talk about this more later. Alien Isolation has a lot of stealth in it. That sounds like a good idea at first until you actually start playing and discover that stealth is all over the place in this game. In hindsight, it feels like it gets a lot better later on in the game, despite you not really encountering any new enemies per se after a certain point. But I can see why a lot of people take issues with isolation stealth as it is. The first thing that really bugged me about isolation stealth is that the human characters have a little too good of a field of vision. Oh, and speaking of vision and stuff, uh... Man, this VHS filter is really hard on the eyes and I'm so glad I eventually learned how to turn it off. Not so much that it's hard, but more along the lines of that it feels silly how they can instantly spot me from 30 meters away when I'm crouching down in near total darkness, not moving, and half of me is obscured behind an object. There's definitely a suspicious state before enemies find you, but for humans, it would seem that it's so slight that it may as well not even be there. The androids are a little better about this and actually feel like an entity you are meant to elude but are also really tough. 
Back to humans though. On top of being able to see you in situations where you'd normally expect to be fine, they are also the best shots in any game I've ever seen. Not only can they see you across a large room while it's pitch dark and you're crouching down behind something, but they're a dead shot under those circumstances too. Now there's this concept I've heard of called the Bioshock rule. It's mostly to do with setting traps or surprise attacks when it comes to DMing a tabletop game, but it goes a little something like this. Just like the splicers in Bioshock, the first shot an enemy takes at you should always miss, aka let them always pass on the dexterity save of the first trap or fudge the attack roll so that your party isn't just taking a damage tax before entering combat or going deeper into a dungeon. Relating this back to video games where this came from in the first place, I'd say that it's best practice that unless you're caught in an incredibly bad spot, the Bioshock rule should apply. Isolation kind of follows the Bioshock rule where the first shot does miss, but when someone finds you, they always fire in two shot bursts and then everybody else does. Let's talk about that room. There's a room early on in Alien Isolation as Amanda Ripley is first making her way into Sevastopol Station. It's kind of a reception area where you get the hacking tool and as soon as you pick it up, a bunch of people come in and they just want to kill you. I'm no stranger to stealth games, but I died a lot in that room. When I complained about this, I was told that this room was meant to be a way to test your metal, but all I really felt like it was teaching me was just to show off how wall detection in this game is is a little weird. Heck, I think I even had a guy detect me and then shoot me through a wall at some point. Also, I don't know exactly what this was supposed to be testing me for because in the end, I just realized that the cop out of intentionally letting everyone see me, running around a corner, and then whacking everyone to death as they wander around the corner worked perfectly fine. I had a conga line of violence and I cleared the room in a minute when I finally just decided to use cheese strats that normally only work in games with very poor stealth AI. Personally, I think this shows me less of how smart the human AI is, but it shows me more that just their vision and accuracy stats are probably as high as they're allowed to be set in engine, but the AI itself is just kind of meh. Speaking of the AI doing silly things like AI seeing you and then wandering around a blind corner single file until they're all dead, the enemy AI is not very smart. Humans make up for this by having their absurd line of sight and androids make up for this by being goddamned tanks. At least the latter half makes sense in world. Uh, Seekson, the company that owns Sevastopol Station where you're currently wandering around, is also in the business of synthetic humanoids. However, on some level they're aware that they cannot keep up with Weyland Yutani, so they're making the cheapo version of an android that literally no one wants. No, really, it's a plot point in the game that seeks and can't find a single buyer for the working Joes that isn't them just trying to cut back on staffing costs. I mean, look at these things. They're so cheap they can't even afford to make it all the way into the uncanny valley. Working Joes will have a hard time spotting you, give up easily if they don't immediately find you, but when they do find you, they'll just walk in a straight line until they get you. This does create quite a scare early in the game when you're encountering them almost exclusively in narrow hallways where you can't juke them, but as soon as you have any space at all, you can just run around a facility for a minute or so to lose them before circling back to the objective while they're all just kind of drawn away for a while trying to figure out if you're still there. Admittedly, these two types of enemies, which both come with stronger variants later in the game, are more of a sideshow to the main baddie of the game because, well, it's not called alien isolation because you're isolated on an alien world. Don't worry, we'll get to it soon enough. It'll even have its own section. Just there's a few other things we got to get to first. Okay, we talked about most of the gameplay stuff. Now we can talk about the spooky stuff. This is a spooky game with some hangups, yes, but it's still a spooky one. It's got that atmosphere. If it's one thing that Creative Assembly absolutely nailed, it's that 70s retro future that Alien is known for. The punch card systems, the computers that are theoretically from a spacefaring age, but still mostly using ASCII graphics, the whole of the station and the ships that you're briefly in during the game nail a future that was made as efficiently as possible to pad out some megacorps bottom line. Even before you see anything that wants to kill you as you're on Sevastopol Station, you get the feel that things are very, very wrong. Lights are going out, but little technology that's still working is on the fritz, and uh, oh yeah, no one is around. I hate to sound like a crusty old late 20-something, but a lot of modern horror games, especially indie and mascot horror games, are seriously lacking in atmosphere. And if it's one thing that isolation nails, it's making you feel that like you are indeed on a space station that's in a very bad way and you have no idea what's going on. Also, if you're not feeling it through the video, I'll admit that for one, OBS doesn't seem to capture gamma settings very well and often I'll accidentally cheat in game by glancing over to my recording display to make sure everything's still going, which is on another 
another screen and be able to see clear as day stuff that's supposed to be pitch dark. And for another, YouTube's compression is probably destroying these dark scenes right now. Early on, isolation does great with starting that slow burn with this atmosphere. And I gotta say, they did a great job restraining themselves and not just immediately dumping the xenomorph in the game for you to run away from. There's a lot of threats on Sevastopol that aren't from other worlds, and it gives you time to appreciate them. Shame that you first meet them in one of the most single frustrating rooms that I've ever played in a game that has stealth. Unfortunately, once the atmosphere's wow factor wears off and the big guy isn't around, Alien Isolation gets very reliant on jump scares. A lot of this comes from working Joes, playing dead that suddenly grab your leg. These are the most frustrating of all because I checked and there's no way to prevent these from happening aside from very carefully walking around them if you even have the option to do so much as that. You can whack on the booby trap Joes all you want, but they'll still grab you as you walk past them. This is the single most frustrating kind of jump scare there is. Something that you can not only entirely predict, but is also essentially just a damage tax if they're placed in the wrong spot. There are other scenes where there's obviously something spooky going to happen, except instead of the anticipation, you just kind of groan and wait for the thing to happen so you can mash a button and move on with your life. Not spooky. Finally, for spookies that aren't the alien, we've got what happens later in the game. Oh no! They're all coming at me in a straight line! I know that maybe this part of the game is supposed to be some sort of catharsis after finally getting a weapon that can affect the shock-resistant working Joes, but damn. The more I played of this game, the more I realized just how reliant on the xenomorph Alien Isolation is. Sure, Alien is literally in the title, but the more you play the not Alien parts, the more you get the feeling that they might have been put there just to pad for time to give you some downtime from eluding the Alien, but Creative Assembly just didn't know what to do with the not Alien parts to keep the tension up. Instead, we get these annoying segments with enemies that are either impossibly good shots or overly tanky, but so slow the solution is to just run around a level for a bit until they get lost. Oh yeah, and we're still a spooky game, so pepper some unavoidable jump scares in there. I don't think I'd be so bent out of shape about this if it wasn't for the fact that it fritters away all the atmosphere that the initial segment of the game works so hard to establish. Because I'm no longer worried about the ominous feel of this near derelict station, but instead wondering if there's a way I can edge around the working jaw on the floor that I know is gonna grab me. Sure, they have some moments where there's a bunch of working Joes and only some of them on the ground are going to come and get you, but they never go for the full fake out. So you just know, okay, one of these is gonna get me. So I just have to wait. I gotta make sure I'm topped off on health because this is gonna take away a third of my health no matter how fast I mash the button. Time for the first cooking segment of this spooky season. Uh, spoilers, I got a little too excited trying to make this dish for the first time and things get a little wiggly on my end, but I got faith that you'll do it right. We're doing Lomo Saltado. It's a cool Peruvian dish that I've loved since a kid, but forgot existed until like last year when I was visiting my parents in the South because, well, I gotta be honest, the Midwest doesn't handle anything spicier than pepper very well. I had to ask my grocery store for literal years for them to start carrying adobo seasoning, but uh, getting a little sidetracked here. Lomo saltado is sort of like a South American stir fried dish that originates from Peru, and we can use any kind of thin beef for it, which I opted for some flank steak because again, I was getting really excited trying to make this when I was putting my recipe together. Now, the first thing I do here, which I am going to not recommend, is doing a salt treatment on the meat beforehand to try and break down the fibers and make it more tender. It didn't really work out how I wanted it to, maybe I did something wrong, but lucky for me, beef is pretty resilient, and once I gave it a good washing off, it was still salvageable, especially since we're gonna let it marinate for a spell too. Now, the marinade for this is based in olive oil with a bit of vinegar, with most of the usual suspects mixed in. The full recipe with measurements is available on the Patreon at $5 tier and higher, and of all the things I did, I think the marinade turned out really well. Mix it all up well, put your beef in a bag with the marinade inside too, put that bag in a bowl, and let it soak overnight. Do not forget that bowl step or it's gonna like leak out onto your other stuff. Alrighty, we got our beef marinated and we're ready to go. Get the beef out of the fridge and while it gets closer to room temperature for the cooking, we're gonna prep the stuff that makes this Lomo Saltado. Since this is kind of like a stir fry, in fact, it 
basically is one in a sense, we're gonna do some veggies and peppers. Take a red onion and cut it up so that you get these like nice fat strips of onion here that'll fry up real good with everything else before getting your gloves on and cutting up your peppers. Now, normally you want Aji Amarillo peppers for this, but um, when I asked a produce clerk at my local store, he looked at me like I was trying to summon a demon when I like asked for them. So we're gonna use Serrano peppers cause that's what they had available to me. Again, you might want to use gloves because these bad boys got some punch to them. These are not jalapenos and they will sting the hell out of your hands and anything you touch for a good while. Put the onions and the peppers aside in one bowl and then take some tomatoes and cut them into these nice fat. Hey, I get it. You're excited for food, but it's not your food. But yeah, make some sick tomato wedges and put them aside so they don't have their juices make everything else kind of soft and squishy in the wrong way. And finally, in a third bowl, wash off and chop up some cilantro and keep that entirely separate because that's coming in at the very end. Finally, we're getting our sides ready before we start frying stuff. Lomo Saltado is served on a bed of French fries or big old fried chunks of potato, uh, however you wanna do them, with a small side of white rice. We're not getting too crazy here and just cooking a bag of frozen fries is what we're gonna do because we wanna focus on other things while the fries are being done. Shoot for a bag of thicker fries like steak or crinkle cut fries and follow the instructions on the bag for baking them in the oven. This is gonna free up space up top on our burners. And also since we're opting to bake instead of like deep fry or pan fry, that is one less thing we have to actively watch while we're doing the rice and the lomo saltado. And maybe you're one of those fancy people that also has a rice cooker, even easier for you. I keep on thinking about getting one of those, but you know, I'm like, eh, I got a pot, that'll do. Now let's get our meat ready. Take the beef out of the bag and slice it into thin, fork sized pieces going perpendicular to the grain or those little lines in the beef. This is gonna help me try to reverse the damage from that salting debacle and will help you out by making the meat much softer and easier to chew. Once it's all cut up, set it aside with just the marinade juices ready to go for the fry. Showtime. Now get a large saucepan, add a little extra oil into it so it doesn't immediately annihilate the marinade and get it hot. Now we're gonna see the other major mistake I made. Again, I was really excited to do this, so I ended up just tossing all my steak into the pan as soon as it was sizzling. Try not to do this. If you have like a lot of meat, cook it in smaller batches so you have better control of the contents of your pan and you can get a better feel for how your meat is doing and if it's done or not. I lucked out in the end and had a uh, passable fry here. Once it's all decently cooked up, pull it all out and set it aside so it can rest and also that you don't overcook it while we're cooking up the veggies. Veggie time. If you used a cast iron for your beef, do not use it here. We're using a lot of aesthetic stuff like tomatoes that will leach off the cast iron and we do not want that. Make sure your pan is sizzling hot again and toss in your veggies excluding the cilantro. Now put a lid over the pan for a while to sort of let it like steam down, checking every three to four minutes. And once they've started to reduce in size a little, take the topper off, maybe give it a toss or two or mix it up if you're not feeling as confident. And then once everything is reduced down and at a level of cook to where it's nice and like soft, but still has a bit of like crispy crunch in it, like on the uh, red onions, it's time to add the meat back in. Toss all your beef back into the pan, mix it up real good. And then once everything Everything is finally mixed evenly. Finally, add in your cilantro. Let it go for like another minute because we don't want to cook the cilantro too much. And you're done. Take it off the heat. It's time to plate up. So we put this together by getting a nice portion of your fries and then putting a big old helping of meat and veggies right on top of them. Some people like to put it on the side, but I like it all together. Then. Once that's all taken care of, take your done rice and then use a small bowl to put a little portion in there and then like smack it down on the plate. So you got like this nice half spear of rice filling up the empty space there. The dish is complete. Now I gotta be honest, while this didn't turn out as bad as I thought it would, especially for a first try, I wanna come back to this once I've got some more Peruvian cooking under my belt. If any of you know any good Peruvian cooking channels, uh, please tell me them in the comments. I want to learn more. And one last thing before we get back to the video. You see the soda right here? If you ever come across it in your travels, Acquire as much of it as you can. This is the best soda. Inca Cola stands beside Iron Brew as one of the few sodas in the world so good it pretty much kicked Coca-Cola out of its home turf. I need more of it, but not even the bougiest stores in my area carry it and it's like $50 a case and shipping fees alone to import it. Pledge to this year's Patreon special so that you can get that cool apron like mine and so I can get more Inca Cola.
All right, I guess it's time we finally talk about the alien itself. Creative Assembly gets full points for building it up. We don't see the alien until two hours in, and then it's only for just a moment as we go, oh shit, it's here. Before that, all we see are clues such as how one single thing has somehow wrecked an entire space station, which lends credence to just how dangerous the Xenomorphs are. Yeah, it's bad to be alone with one on a decent sized ship like the Nostromo, but you let one of these things loose on a large population and that whole region is now a write-off. Even then, we only see the Xenomorph for almost a literal second as we get on one of the most conveniently timed Metro stops ever, but we know it's around even before that. As soon as you get your motion tracker, sometimes it'll just go off when you're seemingly alone. And if you're real fast and whoop it out as soon as the button goes off, you'll see something moving really fast right past you, but there's nothing around, but you know it's in the vents overhead. There's all sorts of funny noises like that too going on throughout the beginning of the game. And the best part is sometimes it possibly is the alien. Sometimes it's just a creaky old space station doing creaky old space station things, but you can't be sure which is which. Then the the thing actually does show up uh, the chapter after you see it at the end of the metro line and unlike the Humies or the working Joes, the alien cannot be defeated. The loading screen tips love to tell you this by the way, usually after it gets you and you are well aware of that. As far as I can tell the alien doesn't have a set pattern and just goes wherever it thinks the action is. Stealth becomes your highest priority because if you're slick and don't make any noise whatsoever, there's a chance the xenomorph won't even bother to spawn into the level. Emphasis on any noise though. If you get caught by someone else, like say a human that has a gun on their person, the noise that gun makes when they're trying to shoot at you will attract the alien to an area just like any noise you might have made. So now ghosting is even more of an imperative in this game because getting caught by trigger happy goons means that even if you escape them, you now have bigger problems. So there is, keyword here being is a way to get the alien to go away for a bit. It might come back later, but it's gone for usually enough time to figure out a new hiding pattern among all the crap strewn about the base or grab whatever you need in an area and getting the hell out. The secret is fire and sometimes large amounts of explosives, but that's rather inefficient. You can also make a little noisemaker grenade to draw the alien away for a bit, which can be quite handy, but then they'll still be around after that and now they'll be on high alert because they heard this weird sound. There's one problem with all of this though. You have no means of fending off the alien until a couple hours after your first proper encounter with it. There are two items that will guarantee that the alien goes away. The Molotov cocktails and the flamethrower. You get the schematics for the Molotov about 90 minutes after your first run in with the Xenomorph. And then a few hours later, you get the flamethrower at about the halfway point of the game. Except that they take it away from you for a while because game contrivance. Okay, so boo hoo, you have mandatory stealth for a few segments before you can start asking the alien to please go away with the power of fire. Well, that's also assuming you have all the crafting parts for a Molotov have on hand as soon as you get the schematics, which personally I think are a little overcomplicated for what a Molotov cocktail is. You can only carry up to three of these plus maybe a couple more in parts if you make literally nothing else in the crafting system, which by the way, obligatory crafting system in game. Thanks to not having a reliable way to deal with a Xenomorph until after the halfway point in game, it kind of subconsciously trains you to just stand still and let the alien get you if it sees you because well, it saw me. I may as well get this over with instead of trying to run and hide and prolonging my reload for another 30 seconds. Okay, so now since I know I have to talk about it, let's talk about how the alien is quote unquote smart. Smart seems to mean that the alien isn't tethered to any one pattern of searching and depending on what you've been doing to avoid it for the bulk of the game, it will react to that. If you're extra sneaky and like to hide in things a lot, it'll start checking containers. If you like to blast it with fire a lot, it'll start respawning faster and faster and possibly even spawning into an area by default instead of waiting for loud noises before it enters the place. It's the kind of smart that's like the bad guys in fear, where they do give off the illusion of intelligence by reacting to the player and then telegraphing that they're reacting, and it's a cool trick. But once you know how the trick works, it's ruined for you. I'm not gonna pick this apart any further because I know there's probably a lot of fancy AI mechanics going on under the hood that I couldn't begin to understand how they really work, but I will tell you that there are plenty of clips out there of people utterly bamboozling the alien in both speedruns and normal play. It would seem that tables are the bane of this thing's existence. For now, I'll leave it at by 
riding the line and mostly sneaking while occasionally just throwing a firebomb at the thing if it was about to find me, uh, just so I didn't get caught. The alien didn't really know what to do with me, so it never specialized in any one thing, be it looking at stealth or spawning more aggressively to like wear down my Molotov stocks. It just kind of had its default behavior throughout the game, which makes things pretty easy in the late game if it's not actively trying a certain tactic against you. All this boils down to the alien initially being a spooky monster like many other horror games, but then completely losing its luster. Maybe it's in part because I have personally played a lot of horror games by now, but there are definitely some mishandlings here. Maybe it's because the game goes on for way too long, so you end up spending too much time with the alien. Maybe it's because if you know what you're doing, it's not that hard to deal with the alien. Maybe it's something else. I can't say for certain that a big factor in it though, is that based on your early experiences with the alien and later on as the alien gets either more aggressive or uh, I don't know, more inquisitive, it essentially becomes a time tax on the player where you have to sit through one of the same three or four death animations, fade to black, and then wait for the game to load again. You're no longer scared of the xenomorph. You're annoyed that you might have to spend another five minutes in an area because you thought you were out of line of sight, but it turns out you weren't. That's really a big bummer. That's the ultimate failure of a horror game monster is you're just annoyed by it now. Time for the story and the odds and ends of Alien Isolation. I'm not gonna go super in depth here when it comes to the story because for one, it's laughably straightforward. And for another, it was so dull at times that after a while I checked out and had to like review my own footage. Another thing that got brought to my attention by uh, Nyamov or now I'm I don't actually know how, the guy that makes Blood West, by the way guys, Blood West is coming out this December in full release, is that with the Xenomorph just always wandering about, you have a hard time appreciating the story because that alien is always on your ass, so you can't really stop to look at notes, and that's not something I really realized until I played some other horror games, like, oh yeah, the monster leaves you alone for a time so you can take in the story. And that just doesn't happen in Alien Isolation. The alien is ever-present in a way to where even if it's not gonna show up, I'm not really taking time to read notes unless I absolutely need to read notes and moving on. You play as obvious final girl Amanda Ripley, who works for the Wayland yutani Corporation. She gets put on a job to go to a place called Sevastopol Station to collect the black box of a ship that had gone missing. Why? Because that ship was the Nostromo, the ship her mommy was on before she went missing. Ripley the Younger, as some characters so generic I forgot their names and just called them Android and Corporate Lady as I was playing the game, get a little weirded out though when they can't dock with the station and then things get a little wild when the spacewalk gets botched by floating debris that definitely shouldn't be there. And then some stuff happens. I hate to gloss over this, but unless you're like way, way into the alien mythos, which I feel like this game is relying on for the bulk of its sales, this game is completely generic in the story section. No one has any sort of personality aside from I'm Mr. Scared all the time, Ricardo, and the dude from the ship that found the Nostromo's black box. I swear to God, everyone is like, Ripley, I'm talking to you in a stern, near monotone voice because things are really bad right now. You need to get to the elevator and do the thing. And yeah, the bulk of this game's plot falls into three categories that we went over earlier. You need to get to a metro station, you need to get to an elevator, we need to get the thing. Sometimes the thing is something that will make the elevator or the metro start working again. It also doesn't help your ability to get engaged in the story that people are constantly dying off screen. So even the few characters you might get attached to somehow end up having unsatisfying deaths or like, oh wait, they're dead. I, I guess we're not exploring this plot line anymore. You want spoilers? Okay, fine. Everyone else, jump to this timestamp. Going, going gone. So Ripley the Younger gets on the station to find that everything is bad and the robots are a little murdery. Oh yeah, and there's a fucking xenomorph on board. She does finally find the Nostromo's black box, but oh no, somebody wiped it clean. How convenient for the plot. I guess we should focus on making sure as few people die as possible, or maybe getting off this derelict station. Ripley the Younger deals with looters, haywire androids, and even a rogue security force going from elevator to elevator until she finds the relatively good security guard's office, talks to the guy who was aboard the ship that found the Nostromo's black box, and we learn in a flashback they decided to follow the coordinates of the Nostromo's original distress beacon in hopes of salvaging alien tech for lots and lots of cash. It goes poorly. They brought something onto Sevastopol Station by accident and everything else that happened happens. 
Sevastopol Station's administration knows this is a very bad situation, and they were gonna decommission this place anyway, so there's a comms blackout while this thing is being dealt with. You agree to help the security guy try to get the alien off the ship, and he tries to yeet you into space with the alien. You survive, but before you can get back and give him a good talking to, he dies off screen, like half the other characters in this game. You and the one guy who's still alive go to the ship's main computer to try and override the communications blackout, where it turns out that Waylon Yutani knew about the alien and intentionally bought the space station while you were in transit to it because they knew the alien was on board and they wanted to exploit it because that's what megacorps do. Ricardo has the idea to try and overload the power system to hard reset the computer or... Look, I forget why we were doing that, but it turns out there's a whole nest of aliens in the power system. We make it go boom and now there's a ton of aliens running around the ship. We go to the salvage guy's ship trying to escape, but it turns out that he just wants to blow up everything by overloading his warp drive or whatever the alien's universe equivalent of a warp drive is. We stop him, but it still does enough damage to the station to put it into a terminal descent. Amanda Ripley has to go real fast to free the Torrens, the ship she came in on, from the influence of the rapidly falling Sevastopol station, which she does at the very last second. We fade away on a scene of Amanda floating in space, just as the lights of the ship find her. And then we get another scene that totally kills the mood of that one. The end. Okie dokie, uh, time for odds and ends. I might be repeating myself a bit here, but uh, I'm gonna try and keep these two unique things that weren't talked about before. There is a lot of casually walking around in alien isolation. Since the alien only cares about walking versus crouching if it's actively suspicious that you might be in an area and it's hunting for you, and if you were to crawl everywhere in this game, it would take even longer and also make it more likely the alien will spot you as you are moving slower, you end up just casually walking everywhere in the stealth segments between ducking into lockers and under desks. You can't go at a full on run because then everyone hears you and you die. So oddly enough, once you know what you're doing, the game does become part walking simulator as you casually stroll through the rapidly decaying space station. There are segments where you do need to run, but those are mostly set pieces or when you're fed up with trying to sneak around the working Joes. And this game, like I said earlier, loves its unnecessary quick time events. I don't mean the oh no, a working Joe on the ground that I could totally tell was merely playing dead grab me, mash interacts to take a damage tax and break free, I mean that you can't just open the door. Like the whole thing I was talking about earlier where you gotta press buttons to put both hands on it and then press another button to do the action of turning the handle. Nearly everything in this game that is not an automatic door that opens when you get close to it has some sort of sequence of button presses you gotta do to interact with it and it's never not tedious. Yes, I understand the idea of having the process of getting into something be long enough to where there is a non-zero chance someone might catch you doing it and you'd want to back out, but that is made pointless by how after you finally hit the exit key, it takes Amanda Ripley a solid second to realize she doesn't want to use the thing anymore and you get caught anyway. And with that being the case, I have no idea why any of these things couldn't just be a press E to interact and then be done with it because it's a linear sequence anyway. Even when you're using something like the ionic torch to cut through a steel object, like you have to go on a set path. You can't just like quickly do a little thing and like see if you can grab the thing like through the door because you have to open the door anyway once you cut through the metal plating. And it's just so tedious. All of this could have been press E to interact. Like, yeah, I get like maybe for longer things like cutting through the steel plating in front of vent guards, which feels very this is here because plot anyway might have the option to like, okay, you can press E to start and then it will take a solid 10 seconds, but you can back out of that and like run away and finish it later. But this game, all it does is all these pointless interactions pad the game's runtime by 10 seconds at a time. Frankly, this game loves its padding. There's segments where you gotta run through dark areas where you can hardly see, but the Xenomorph is teleporting from vent to vent and will grab you if you even get remotely close to the opening of the ventilation shaft and you die. And then you have to keep repeating the whole segment where you can barely see where you're going until you've memorized where all the vents are and you can't really see them, but you know exactly where each enemy is going to be wandering through and you're just doing this all on muscle memory now. Like each little thing I've talked about might have been an inconsequential hiccup, but when you combine the gotcha working Joes that you can't disable was a quick time event doors and the trial and error alien segments and anything else I'm probably forgetting about now as I write this, it paints a picture of a game that is blatantly padding for runtime, which is the last thing you want to do in a horror game. The longer you're in a horror game, the more inoculated against the game's brand of spookies you get, which leads to stuff like the alien becoming tedious instead of scary. Finally, the game is buggy, particularly in the earlier sections. 
Stuff would pop in and out of existence, or sometimes I'd find myself floating away for no reason until I could drift close enough to a thing I can interact with, which would retether myself to the world. Apparently, this is something that speedrunners intentionally get to happen because once you start drifting, because your feet are not touching the floor properly, you make no sound, and the alien isn't able to find you. There were also multiple areas where a scripted sequence completely bugs out, such as an NPC not spawning, so a working Joe is just beating up the air really hard for a moment, or where the Xenomorph forgets to properly kill some NPCs, so they just stood there awkwardly as I walked past them. Okay, so that's the game. No, I did not play the DLCs, I thoroughly did not enjoy my time with the base game, and I did not want to play any more of it. What I really want to know is why does this game exist as it does? As I alluded to earlier, Alien Isolation had a ton of rewrites and changes made to it later in development that cut out entire levels and plot lines. Some allege that this was in reaction to Alien's Colonial Marines being such a dumpster fire that things were radically changed in order to distance itself as much as possible from that game, but still doesn't explain why Sega got the Total War guys to make a survival horror game. Was Sega just out of Western studios it had ties with on hand and needed to make a certain number of games to keep the license? Why couldn't someone with more experience in horror take a crack at it? Hell, I think a Japanese studio spin on the Aliens universe could be pretty cool. However, that wasn't what we got in the end, and frankly, what we did get feels like a bunch of RTS guys played Dead Space and System Shock 2 to try and get ideas for how a horror game in space works. Maybe if we had the luxury of stopping, taking a breath, and putting things on hold for a few years, we would have gotten two or maybe three solid eight to 10 hour games that had the time to tell the story they wanted to while still being engaging, instead of one that runs for 16 to 20 hours, which severely outstays its welcome and doesn't even tell the full story it was planning on telling. I did not expect to be talking about this game for nearly as long as I have been, but another thing that bugs me about this game is that there are a number of people that make a ton of excuses for it and try to say that it was all news outlets giving it bad scores were just being meanies or whatever, and for a while I believed it until I actually played the game for myself. And then I saw the truth of it all. This is just Hogwarts legacy for people that can talk about their their opinions on Prometheus for longer than the movie's runtime. Alien Isolation is essentially a mediocre at best tie-in game with a recognizable intellectual property spread all over it. But because it's an intellectual property that you like and you don't get a lot of stuff for, and frankly, the intellectual property as a whole has been in a bad spot lately and you're just looking for anything to let you just enjoy your thing. People are willing to make mountains of excuses for it, especially after how poorly done the last game was. So people pretend it's secretly an immersive sim or some hidden gem that just the game journalist didn't get. But the truth is, it's just the closest thing Alien fans have to a passable game made in the last decade decade when it launched, and nothing's came out since then. As I write this, I am aware that this year there's supposed to be a game called Aliens Dark Descent coming out supposedly this year, which is either an RTS or a tactics game depending on who's talking about it, but it's March as I finally finish writing and start recording this, and we haven't seen anything but screenshots and reveal trailers containing only pre-rendered footage as far as I can tell. That's not a good sign. So, little update on this. I don't know if they changed this around or if I just genuinely misread it towards the end of last year, but it seems like Alien Dark Descent is coming out June 22nd. So it's like in a few weeks of me writing this because I'm coming back to do addendums and make sure I've got everything right, but it'll have been out for a few weeks by the time you see this. Uh, so I'll just put an update here to see how it does because right now it's kind of looking like just basically Diet XCOM 2 set in the world of aliens, which... That actually could be pretty good. Okay, so here I am uh, checking out the reviews and showcases of Aliens Dark Descent, and hey, it's not awful. A good number of outlets are saying it's even pretty good. Like, I'm looking at the Metascore right now, and it's in the mid-70s as I write this, but it looks like it might even be in the high 70s or even the low 80s, if not for, like, one outlet that just bodied the game. You know what? You love to see it. That's like a win for fans of Aliens games and stuff that like, and as far as I can tell, like through seeing like Mandalore's videos and stuff, you guys don't catch very many breaks, like case in point being this video. Uh, I hope you guys are all enjoying that game. Um, I'm glad I kind of held off to see like, okay, let's see if this is actually going to be like good or a disaster. And I am happy that it is not a disaster because who actually wants a game to be bad?
Now I know that I have been a big fat meanie pants and you're probably gonna call me a game journalist or something for most of this video, but I wanna end this on a positive note. In spite of everything, the controversy around the previous game which led to drastic changes, the annoying gameplay, the dull story, the overlong runtime, while Creative Assembly was certainly out of their depth here, they still cared and put a lot of love into this game. While a lot of the gameplay stuff is bleh at best and the pacing of the scares is miserable, Creative Assembly took the time and care to recreate the world of Alien as best as they could, or frankly, as best as anyone could, and it shows. Sevastopol feels like a station people would live and work in. The characters, while made of wood, are made of a wood that fits in with the grain of the setting, and they nailed the retro future tech. It's a shame they didn't get to make the game that they were intending on making because of all the bullshit that happened around Colonial Marines, but unfortunately, that is the world we live in. Creative Assembly went back to making Total War games, and they're doing fine now, and they're gonna make another FPS. Apparently, it's some kind of co-op shooter, and they've got the glue gun from Typhon. Yeah, fuck it. Good luck with that creative assembly. I'm rooting for you. Oh boy, this was a ride. Thank you all for joining me on this and please consider liking the video, which does indeed help other people find this video because algorithm. Don't forget to check out the specials over at patreon.com slash charlatanwonder and always remember one thing. You do not make content. You make art. Be it traditional drawing, scrapbooking, modifying cars, whatever you do, Content is a demeaning word made by neckties to reduce what you do into a cheap slurry that they can monetize and placate the masses. Your art is better than that. What you do has your stylings, your skill, and your intentions tied to it in a way that makes it irrevocably a reflection of you. And you are not content. So go out there and fight for your art because in this world, it would be a sad place to live in if we didn't have your art. Stay saucy, everyone. So, uh, please excuse my bed is not properly made, but I can't make it. Because the Chonkalis decided to sit on my gym bag on my bed. And I can't move him. I think this might be revenge, because I tried to take the pillow back, which was for my chair in the first place, thank you very much. But now he sits on the gym bag, which is full of smells. Maybe he's also upset that I wouldn't open the window for him so he can stare outside of it because I was recording the Big Kenshi video. But I'm going to pet him. Ooh, I got a pet in. That is one pet. Can I go for two? Two pets. Uh, I couldn't get three. Better than nothing. I can get you chin. Get you, get you, get you, get you. Oh no, he's mad. Well, that's part of the point. If I can get him to leave the gym bag, I can make my bed. Hmm. What else could I possibly do to bother him? A squirrel. A squirrel. A squirrel. He's just not having it. You win for today, Chonkalis, but I will get you off my bed so I can make it.